Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. I appreciate your time and attention. You know how much I adore you guys. With me today is Dr. Jeff Gelblum. He is a neurologist that specializes in dementia, and he is going to talk to us a little bit about how we can assess our risk of Alzheimer's and probably other dementias. So thanks for joining me. Can I just call you Dr. Jeff? Why not? Yeah, Dr. Jeff always makes it easy, Jennifer. Sounds terrific. Go for it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself first, and then we can jump into questions or... Okay. Well, I'm I'm a board certified neurologist. What that means is I've completed a uh, specialty uh, residency training and then uh, have been in practice down here in Miami, Florida uh, for over 20 years. I'm in a very large neurology group. The name of our group is called First Choice Neurology. Uh, And we have several offices in the South Florida area, basically from Key West up to Orlando, Uh, both sides of the state, uh, from uh, Miami side over to Sarasota side and up to Tampa. Uh, So we do a lot of neurology work and my focus, my area of love and specialization is dementia. So what I look forward to doing uh, right now with you and our listeners is to explain what uh, we neurologists mean by dementia, how dementia differs from, let's say, just normal age-related memory loss, meaning when does one need to seek medical attention because there's a serious problem, Uh, and then what we can do to treat the dementia. And for those of us who have loved ones or family members uh, who are suffering from this condition, how can we, uh, as caregivers and and, and friends and, and family members, how can we assess our own risks of dementia? And right now, We've got lots of tools, uh, lots of test uh, capability so that we can not only make a firm diagnosis of dementia, Alzheimer's disease in particular, uh, but also uh, do some pretty good testing with regard to further dementia risks. And what I'd like to do today is offer our listeners some helpful hints as to what you can do if you are at risk to help mitigate those risks. So ask away. We're going to have a very uh, informative and fun uh, discussion today. Sounds terrific. So I'll give you my background first, um, since you probably don't don't have time to listen to all my stories on the show here. So my maternal great-grandmother had what they called senile dementia back in the day. She died before I was born. I was born at the end of 66. So I don't think they knew as much about dementias and brain diseases as we do now. At least I, I hope we know a lot more now. My maternal grandmother had vascular dementia, probably due to an aneurysm that leaked in her brain for three months before they fixed it. That was an exciting time. And then my mother had, um, she had early onset Alzheimer's, although she was very good at not getting diagnosed until she was mid-stage. So technically she wasn't diagnosed early enough to have the early onset diagnosis, but She started showing signs. Obviously, when you look backwards, it's like, oh, yeah, that was probably a sign when she was like 53, which Mm -hmm. is pretty young. Mm -hmm. Um, I think some of what may have triggered, if this is, and you can completely correct me if I'm off base here. She was in a serious car accident at the end of 91, and she hit her face so hard on the steering wheel that she permanently damaged the nerve that comes through your cheekbone. And I think... Whatever underlying risks she had for Alzheimer's, I think that may have sped it up. Is that a thing? Sure. Okay. I, I have enough uh, secondhand knowledge to be dangerous. Yes. Yeah. yeah, head trauma. Head trauma, of course, can be a risk factor for dementia. Yeah, I have a way, way old episode. That's great grammar. A very old episode where I talked to a, a, another podcaster who's had a countless number of, um, uh uh-oh, the word just slipped my mind, Um, concussions, because he's played hockey, he lives in Canada, he's slipped on icy stairs and fallen. I mean, the guy needs to go out wrapped in bubble wrap with a helmet on, always. So, And he has 
at a very young age, he's got some cognitive issues that I'm sure are from the concussions. Sure. Well, that's a condition called uh, chronic uh, traumatic encephalopathy. In fact, <clears throat> it's been uh, shown that in a lot of older uh, football players, that if uh, their brains do come to autopsy, let's say they die from a heart attack or from some other cause, and those brains are autopsied, uh, we do see findings there of Alzheimer's uh, pathology. Uh, so we call this chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which means that individuals such as uh, football players, hockey players, anyone with repetitive head trauma is at risk of developing dementia later on in life. So that's a well-established risk factor. So would you say having two concussions over the course of your adult life lifespan, would that, I've had, well, I've had one for sure, maybe one, I have had, I flew off my bicycle seven years ago, slammed into the pavement, broke my collarbone, and basically knocked myself out cold. Now they did, they did some kind of scan. I forgot what it was because I wasn't quite with it. And they said I didn't have a concussion, but a lot of people are very disbelieving well, of that. Well, if you've knocked yourself out, if, if you've lost consciousness, that would be a diagnosis of concussion. You know, two two concussions over the course of a lifetime uh, is is probably of no great concern. Uh, where we get concerned Ooh. is repeated sports concussions. And, and that's why it's very important uh, that football players are monitored on the field and often taken out of play uh, in the event of a loss of consciousness. And that's that's why the, uh, the the helmets are better designed than they ever were. And uh, the, the people uh, involved in the actual football game itself, as well as soccer and hockey, are, are very attuned to athletes losing consciousness. So this is a real hot topic now in sports health. Uh, and repeated concussions, of course, can cause problems down the road. But just two concussions over many years, probably nothing much to worry about. Yeah, they were at least... 20 years apart, save, let's see, one was September of uh, 96, and the other one was May of 2016. So I had a few not, years between them, so I think... Not, <laughs> thankfully, not, not, not to worry too much there. Not to worry too much there. That's good. I just thought, since you brought it up, I thought I'd ask. Um, it's interesting that they, they claimed I didn't have a concussion, yet everybody's like, if you knocked yourself out, yeah, that wasn't typically, good. I mean, the yeah, typically loss of consciousness is, is is one of the defining aspects of a concussion. But what I'd like to do is is really remind our listeners about how we differentiate what we mean by dementia, because you and I now have used that term several times. Uh, dementia is a disorder. It's actually considered a disease. Uh, it's more commonly seen in older folks, but it can occur in younger folks. And by older folks, I mean individuals over age 65. But dementia, by definition, uh, means a problem of short-term memory, as well as a problem of functionality. A heck of a lot different than just age-related memory loss. So what I always say is, well, if I forgot to if I forgot where I put my car keys, that's age-related forgetfulness. But if I then find the keys and don't know what they're for, well, now that's a sign of dementia. So by functional loss, we mean problems with uh, getting lost, meaning problems of orientation, uh, problems of language. So short-term memory loss plus a language disturbance, that would constitute dementia. Short-term memory loss with disorientation, getting lost, that would constitute a dementia. Short-term memory loss with behavioral changes, that would constitute a dementia. Short-term memory loss with visuospatial problems, not recognizing something, that would constitute a dementia. Short-term memory loss with praxis difficulty, meaning inability to do customary activities such as uh, at, turning on the shower spigot, uh, or washing dishes, or eating with a knife and fork. We call those things praxis, practical things. Uh, that would be a dementia. So it's very important for our listeners, particularly older listeners, to say, hey, if you can't forget Aunt Mary's middle name, or you have difficulty when you walk into the grocery store remembering whether it was supposed to be milk and orange juice or milk and prune juice, uh, that's, that's probably... Uh, just age-related forgetfulness. But if it comes into issues 
of navigating day in, day out through our activities of, of living, then at that point, that raises concern about dementia. And at that time, uh, medical uh, medical evaluation should be obtained because there's all different causes of dementia. In fact, you yourself mentioned vascular dementia. What is that? Not enough blood flowing to the brain. Alzheimer's dementia. What is that? Amyloid plaques and tangles in the brain. So different pathology altogether. And then you also mentioned head trauma, post-traumatic dementia. So dementia is a catch-all term for individuals who suffer from short-term memory loss, as well as a decline in some domain of functionality, a far different scenario than age-related forgetfulness, and certainly a situation that warrants medical evaluation and can typically be treated. Okay. Are they getting better at diagnosing? Because I'm sure you've heard them, most of us have heard the stories about you know, you, you start having these forgetful scenarios and you go to the doctor, maybe you go for your annual checkup and you're like, Hey doc, I'm, I'm having some problems with my memory. And you kind of get, Oh, it's just normal aging or it's just whatever. Oh, we all get like that. Or the, God forbid the doctor's like, Oh, I forgot what I did yesterday myself. We, We all hear those stories. And I'm wondering if now, you know, we've seen, I've been doing this podcast for six years. So there, I've seen a, a big change in a lot of things. Um, And I was, like I said earlier, my mom was very good at uh, avoiding the diagnostic process. So I'm not super familiar with how that works, surprisingly. I mean, I I have a general idea, but are they getting better at diagnosing? They are absolutely getting better. And at this point in time, here we are, uh, May 25, 2023, uh, we have marvelous tools to make a confirmed diagnosis of dementia and what type of dementia. So typically what I always recommend, and I'm going to certainly reiterate this to all of our listeners today, is if you're over 65 and you go to the doctor for your annual physical, they should, as a matter of routine, perform something called a mini mental status exam, MMSE. It's a 30-point quiz. Uh, spell world backwards. Remember these three objects. After five minutes, draw two intersecting pentagons. Uh, give me your home address. Those are the types of quiz uh, items on the mini mental status exam. And as long as you can get 26 to 30 out of 30 on that mini mental status, you're doing okay. But once your number declines below 26 out of 30, once you're not, once you're at that threshold, then that is certainly a cause for concern. Uh, Not worry, but concern. Uh, And at that point, it's incumbent upon the primary doctor to take further steps to evaluate if a dementia is ongoing, because if it is, oftentimes it's very treatable and reversible. I know some medications can mimic a dementia. Absolutely. We know that medications such as beta blockers, uh, some of the statins, uh, if patients are on uh, tranquilizers like Valium or Clonopin uh, to help with sleep, certainly uh, those items can cause cognitive problems, uh, particularly in older folks. Uh, so anybody over age 65 that is concerned about loss of short-term memory should certainly speak with their primary care provider. Uh, a mini mental status exam should be performed. There's variations on the mini mental status exam. Uh, There's another test called a MOCA, which stands for Montreal Cognitive Assessment. There's something called a slums test, which has nothing to do with where you live, uh, but it means uh, St. Louis uh, Mental Status Inventory, designed at WashU at University of St. Louis. Uh, All of these tests are very good, reliable tools that each and every one of us, meaning us doctors, uh, have the ability to perform very quickly in just a matter of moments uh, at the at the chair side in the doctor's office. Uh, and at that point, we will have an understanding as to whether you're normal or not uh, with regard to uh, cognitive functioning. And at that point, we can take further steps. So let's talk about the further steps. Uh, further steps would include a test like a brain MRI. 
Brain MRI is a wonderful tool to look at. It gives us a picture of the brain. So it's a great way to see if there's been a stroke or if there's a tumor or if there's fluid on the brain. We call that hydrocephalus. Those are the types of things that we can treat very quickly. So very important to get that brain MRI. Uh, beyond that, uh, we neurologists have tools like an EEG, which is an electroencephalogram, a brainwave test where we put the little wires on the head like an EKG of the heart. Well, we neurologists use an EEG of the head. Uh, and, and you know, of course, Jennifer, you're looking at me. I know on the podcast, <laughs> it's only audio, but I always advise my my, my listeners or whoever I talk to only take advice from a bald neurologist. We can, <laughs> we can point to all the area. I'm bald, obviously. Uh, we can point to all the areas of the brain that are impacted. So bald neurologists are your best friend for visual purposes. Uh, but an Makes EEG, sense. Yeah, EEG is a good way uh, to evaluate brain function. Uh, and then if those tests suggest that we might be dealing with an Alzheimer-like condition, then we can even take it one step further. Uh, there's a certain test that we do called a PET scan, positron emission tomography, a PET scan, where we inject you with a little bit of medicine. Uh, and then a few minutes later, we put you in the scanner and we can see if there's actually Alzheimer plaque on the brain. And that's definitive. Okay. So I, I wasn't got, sure when we shifted from you could only diagnose Alzheimer's post-mortem. Oh, to, no. No, 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 no. We diagnose Alzheimer's disease definitively each and every day in my office in South Florida. Yes. And how and, long has that been um, a tool? That PET, scan, that PET scan technology's been out there for at least five years. Okay. Uh, and even along with that, uh, if somebody uh, doesn't have access to a PET scan, there's a simple test that we neurologists do called a spinal tap, lumbar puncture, where kind of like an epidural, uh, we put a little needle in the base of the spine, numb it up first so nobody uh, winces in too much pain, draw off a little fluid, send that fluid out to the laboratory, and in about two weeks, we'll get back the answer as to whether there's uh, amyloid, uh, central nervous system amyloid. And as we know, amyloid is the pathologic hallmark signal of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is diagnosed each and every day in the living, functioning human. Uh, and the earlier we can get that diagnosis, the better off we are, because there are treatments that are now FDA approved to deactivate that amyloid. And we use those treatments every day. Well, we'll so get back to those. Way long way. Okay. My mom was diagnosed in September of 2011. So definitely not within the last five years when she's been gone for three. Yeah. So, well, and I can tell I you that the first FDA approved medication for modifying Alzheimer's, meaning what do we have available to actually deactivate the amyloid? Uh, that drug was approved in the summer of 2021. Yep. Add ucanumab. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Good for you. Your your articulation is perfect. Oh, well, I have had, had some practice. Yeah. Um, I am in an Alzheimer's Association, amongst other things, but I am one of their legislative advocates. Ah. So I was in Washington, D.C. this past March basically saying, yo, Medicare, uh, we need to cover these treatments. It's the only FDA approved drugs that are not covered by Medicare, right. which I'm sure you know. Yes. I deal with that on a daily basis. Yes. So, well, bravo um, for your help there. Thank you. <laughs> it is rather frustrating. And, you know, I, I try to be, I don't know what the right word is, but I, I try to look at the whole picture. Like, it obviously doesn't affect my family because my mom is gone and nobody currently has any signs of any dementias. Thank goodness we've had enough. Thank you very much. Um, but it seems like maybe aducanumab didn't work that well. Lecanemab is better? Well, let, let me let me say this. Uh, aducanumab was the first one out of the race. It was the first horse. Uh, and the problem with that horse is some of the uh, studies that went along with the launch of that horse were flawed. The horse wasn't necessarily bad, but the races that the horse ran in weren't so great. Okay. So the horse- <laughs> That's a good analogy. To, the horse came to the track with somewhat of a sullied reputation, okay? It was a muddy horse. 
Not to say it wasn't a good horse, just a muddy horse. And and we we use that horse. We prescribe aducanumab and have been using that drug since its launch uh, two over almost two years ago. Uh, but the problem is it came to the track muddy in that the, the clinical data, the studies that were used to help uh, develop the drug were, were very were very um, deficient. The, the studies were not as rigorous as they should have been. But be that as it may, uh, the uh, way the drug works is to deactivate amyloid plaque. So, so its mechanism of action is valid. Uh, this past January, a chemical cousin of aducanumab uh, Licanumab was FDA approved. So now that's a cleaner horse uh, on the track because Licanumab had better studies. It, the way the studies were developed and designed were just a little more rigorous, uh, a little smarter. So it's a better horse in the race only because it came to the race clean. Aducanumab was the horse that came a little dirty to the race. Uh, and then we're going to probably have another horse come into this race uh, called Dunanumab. Uh, which is by Lily, Lily Drugs. So now we've got three horses on the track working very similarly, uh, and they all uh, do one thing. And what they do is they take that amyloid plaque uh, and they uh, get rid of it off of the brain. And in so doing, uh, the clinical data suggests that patients who undergo that treatment have a much slower rate of decline and oftentimes have significant improvement. So these drugs go after the amyloid plaque, the plaque on the brain. Uh, there's a couple of side effects associated with them. So we neurologists have to be very careful that patients receiving that treatment, and these are IV treatments, by the way, you can't take a pill, uh, that patients receiving uh, those IV infusions, we monitor them with uh, follow-up brain MRIs to make sure that these anti-plaque drugs aren't causing any brain swelling or bleeding. And that's easy to pick up on the MRI scan. So that's why we do follow-up brain MRIs, just to make sure that patients aren't having any significant problems from the drugs. But overall, the tolerability of the drugs is excellent. Patients respond very well to the treatment. The comfort associated with the treatment is good, meaning no side effects, no headaches, no dizziness. So rather straightforward approach. And what we know is that the amyloid levels of those patients' brain, those amyloid levels drop. Uh, and we think that that positively impacts uh, the uh, trajectory of the Alzheimer's process. So that's where we are right now in May of 2023. It's a very, it's a very opportune time because we've now got three drugs uh, that are available to us, well, actually two plus one coming out probably in September, uh, that can allow us to deactivate the underlying cause of Alzheimer's. Now, remember, there's other forms of dementia besides Alzheimer's. So, you know, <laughs> gonna, you know and, and those other forms require other treatments. But in addition to treating the underlying Alzheimer plaque, we can use other medications that help provide cognitive improvement. So drugs like dinepazil, maybe you've heard of it, it's called Aricept, uh, that comes in pill and patch form. Uh, so basically that brings, uh, that brings up levels of brain acetylcholine, which is responsible for memory. There's another drug that's FDA approved called Namenda, otherwise known as Mamantine, which helps lower levels of brain glutamate, which is an irritative neurochemical. So there's all sorts of strategies that we neurologists use to not only diagnose, but treat. So that's why getting back to your initial question is when should you seek help or ring the, uh, ring the bell for help with regard to memory, to your fading memory, <laughs> uh, that, that, that bell should be rung sooner rather than later because we've now got a lot of good interventions. And there's a lot of things one can do you know, get, I mean, this sounds morbid, but getting fares in order. We've got episodes where we talk about how um, this gal actually married her husband after his diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And they basically planned how they would manage his care needs together while he was still able to do that. And they got to address their concerns and stuff. So there's a lot of things we can do if we don't put our head in the sand like my mother did. Now, well, interest. 
I was going to say, I have a really quick question. Go ahead, because I want (laughs) to weigh in more about what we can do. Okay. Well, let's do that, and then I'll get to my question. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. So what else can we do besides future planning? And that's always important. Uh, I'm a big advocate of what's called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. And I know you know about that. Uh, That's the Mediterranean Interventional Neurodegenerative Delay Diet, M-I-N-D. It's a Mediterranean diet. Uh, And basically it says, stay away from processed foods, stay away from uh, a lot of red meat, stay away from uh, a lot of cheese and and fatty foods, stick with the olive oil, stick with the nuts, stick with the fish, stick with the lean poultry, uh, stick with the veggies. Uh, Basically, whatever you would eat uh, in in the villages of Sicily uh, or Southern Italy, uh, that's what's on the diet. So it's a very Mediterranean influenced diet, gets away from butter. Uh, and it's been shown uh, that individuals who subscribe to that diet, MIND, the MIND diet, and all of our listeners can Google it and look it up, uh, that those, those individuals have a better prognosis with regard to dementia. Uh, we also know that on a daily basis, 30 minutes of exercise, uh, Brisk walking. You don't have to go to the gym. You don't have to do squats or push-ups or pull-ups or buy a Peloton bike. Oh, I have a Peloton. (laughs) Well, I I hope it's not serving as a planter or you're you're drying out your underwear on it right now. Nope. If you use it, that's good. Uh, But what we know is 30 minutes of exercise, brisk exercise, walking, something as simple as outdoor walking quickly uh, is enough to stimulate the cardiac output. Uh, get the blood oxygen going. And that has also uh, been shown to delay the uh, consequences of dementia. So those two simple things, Mediterranean diet, daily brisk walking for 30 minutes, those two simple things uh, have been shown in the medical literature to positively impact uh, dementia. So those are the first two things that I'm going to recommend that right now to everybody, regardless of whether you're at risk for Alzheimer's or not. It definitely is. It helps aid the aging process, helps you age better. Yes, it sure Um, does. But yeah, I know I use my Peloton almost every day. And I have a golden retriever, so we do walk a lot too. There you go. Or or the dog walks you. You walk the dog or the dog walks you? Um, She's pretty good about uh, shared walking. We had another golden until this past February you got you open the door, man. That dog power walked up Boy, the hill. Yeah. Heel was not a thing. Slow down was not a thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, walking yeah, him was not. Fevers will keep you in shape. That's for sure. That is true. Well, she's a uh, very food motivated, and so <laughs> but she likes her carrots and she likes everything. Good. So she, you don't have to just feed her. Well, the- in my office, I have Scooter here. I'll show you our our listeners can't. Oh. Hear. Scooter's in the corner. He's in his little <laughs> bed. Scooter's our neurology service dog. He's been with us for 14 years. He's 15. He's a shelter dog. uh, And he comes to work every day. And he helps with our patients. And he goes from room to room. And uh, he comforts them. And 
they enjoy seeing him. So it's a real, it's a real good uh, reciprocal uh, situation there. Yeah, I take my girly to the senior center when I go. I teach a class there, and well, I'm always hesitant because obviously golden retrievers are much bigger than scooter, and you know not everybody is enamored of bigger dogs. They some people have a fear, although I don't know how you could ever be afraid of a golden retriever. But man, she I, I'm wondering how long I can use the excuse of she lost her younger brother earlier this year to take her all kinds of places. I'm, yeah. I'm one of those ladies that would I it was she would be a purse dog if she didn't weigh over 70 pounds. Right. Well Scooter's pretty good. He's about 12 pounds and he comes to work every day. And it's really funny, Jennifer, because uh patients when they come into the office, they don't even ask if the doctor is in. They say, <laughs> Where's Scooter? Uh can I pet Scooter? So Scooter, Scooter is the best employee we've got in the whole office because he keeps everybody nice and calm. I'll say if you got high blood pressure after petting Scooter, you got a problem. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I just read this morning. So we're coming out with more tests for dementias, mostly Alzheimer's. And one of the uses of the tests, and I don't remember which one it was, you'll probably have to fill that part in, is testing for the um, the brain bleeds and the st the the rare side effect that you can get from the two drugs yes. that are yeah. treatments. Yeah, I, I spent a moment talking about that. So let me circle back and and, and uh, reiterate. Uh, the, the new drugs that you've mentioned, that I've mentioned, aducanumab, lecanumab, denanumab, those drugs that basically scrub away the amyloid plaque off the brain, which is what's mucking up the works and causing trouble. Uh, those drugs can have some rare side effects. Uh, and uh, those side effects are what we call ARIA, A-R-I-A. And what that means is amyloid-related imaging abnormality. And what that means is for those patients who are on these drugs, if you have an MRI, sometimes those drugs can cause a little bit of swelling or bleeding, edema or hemorrhage. So if that's the case, we would, we would temporarily hold the drug, uh, wait for those side effects to go away, uh, by MRI evaluation, MRI criteria, uh, and then we would restart the drugs. And this is the analogy that I always use, Jennifer. When you go to the dentist and have your teeth cleaned to get rid of the dental plaque, what's the commonest side effect from that or what happens? You can bleeding have gums. a little bit of bleeding gums when you spit into the spittoon, it gets a little bloody. Uh, so, And what are they doing? They're scraping off the plaque. So you can have a little bit of bleeding and swelling. It's the same concept uh, with these new medications. They're taking off brain plaque, brain amyloid plaque. And obviously we can have a that side effect of uh, a little bit of bleeding and swelling uh, caught early. These are not life-threatening side effects. Uh, we know to watch for that. All of us neurologists watch for that. I should say those neurologists who are using these medications, such such as I, uh, and uh, we can we can temporarily hold off the medication if we see that come up. And that's so with these these upcoming the newer tests. I think one of them is a blood test. Would that well, make it easier to test? No, there's no blood test for ARIA. A-R-I-A by definition is a, is, a, is a brain MRI finding. What there is happening now is very interesting is artificial intelligence. There's certain programs that the radiologists are using uh, to detect microscopic uh, early onset ARIA. So that technology is, is really growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, but there's no blood test for ARIA. There is a blood test now for the amyloid plaque. Uh, I think that's the one I was reading about. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a blood test. It's called AB amyloid beta 4240. Uh, it's a commercially available test, meaning you have to go to the doctor. They can requisition it and send you over to the lab. And AB 4240 is a blood test <clears throat> that is specific for brain amyloid. Now, let me say this. It's not as sensitive as it should be. So there's still some work that needs to be done with that blood test. So at this point in time, I don't use those blood tests as a threshold to starting medication. I just don't find them to be sensitive enough. And I'll tell you why. Patients who have problems with uh, kidney functioning or patients who have sustained high blood pressure, 
they can have abnormalities of that blood AB4240 test having nothing to do with brain Alzheimer's. So at that point, I don't, I, I find the test still has a couple of problems with it. So therefore I prefer the PET scan, which I talked about earlier. If I can do that, I'd prefer a PET scan. And if I don't have access to a PET scan, I'll do a spinal tap because the spinal fluid is very sensitive and specific for that. So blood test technology, it's, it's, it's evolving. And if we meet again next year, maybe I'll come back and I'll say, Jen, the blood tests are the way to go. But as it stands right now in May of 2023, I can't say that. Okay, that's good to know. So we've been talking about assessing your, well, we have the whole topic was assessing your risk of Alzheimer's. We've talked about all this other stuff, which is very helpful and very fascinating. But what are the main risk factors associated with Alzheimer's disease? And I'm going to qualify that with, you would love have loved my mom's diet. So my mom, my parents ate Wonder Bread, bologna, American cheese. Um, you know, my mom drank two liters of Diet Coke every day. <laughs> Well, I don't eat like that. The, that's not part of the Mediterranean diet. That's the Schmediterranean diet. So we're not going to talk about the Schmediterranean diet. We're going to talk about the Mediterranean. But, you know, look, back in the day, they, they didn't know the things that we know now. And, you know, that was that was them. Uh, so, you know, God bless Cheese Whiz and Oscar Mayer bologna and Wonder Bread, all of those things. OK, I ate them when I was a little kid. And here I am. And I drank out of the hose in the backyard. and. We didn't know from bicycle helmets either, okay? So we managed to survive. But we now know a lot more things today. Uh, and we do know, of course, that the incidence of Alzheimer's, of dementia is rising, probably as a consequence of, of people living longer. Uh, but inescapably, uh, the Mediterranean diet is the way to go, particularly if you have a family history. Now, you know, if you're, if you're 18 to 25 years of age, no family history, Go have your hot dogs to your heart's content and throw on extra mustard and pickles for me. Okay, go enjoy yourself. Uh, but if there is a family history of diet, the earlier uh, that you can get started on this Mediterranean program, probably the better off you are. Uh, so let's talk about what are the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease? That's real important. Family history is probably the most important risk factor of all. Uh, we know that in many respects, Alzheimer's disease is hereditary. Uh, now, you've got different forms of dementia in your family, so I'm just not sure how strong the hereditary is in your particular case, because vascular dementia and Alzheimer's dementia, two different birds. So one has nothing to do with the other. Uh, head trauma, for example, or chronic illness that can cause dementia. So what we know is that Alzheimer's is hereditary. There are many genes that contribute to the development of Alzheimer's disease. Now, the commonest gene that we hear about is ApoE3, ApoE4. So if right now I were to go and get one of those 23andMe uh, tests for Alzheimer risk, it's only going to look at two things, ApoE3, ApoE4. People who are double carriers of ApoE4 are at highest risk. And people who are double carriers of ApoE3 are at lowest risk. So that's the spectrum. And I'm showing you with my hands. Hopefully our, our pod listeners will be able to, to visualize it. But on the left is ApoE3, minimal risk. On the right is ApoE4, maximal risk, double carriers. But there's a whole lot of combinations in the middle. And ApoE3 and ApoE4 don't tell the entire story. Because we know that lots of folks who have ApoE4 double carriers don't get Alzheimer's. And we know that lots of folks, ApoE3 double carriers, supposedly no risk, do get Alzheimer's. So we know that those are imperfect screening tools for Alzheimer risk. And that's why for those of us who want to get a 23 I mean, please don't send me one for Father's Day. I don't need to know about these things because oftentimes they're misleading. So I'm not a big advocate of 23 Me tests, you know, unless you've got to know something about someone. There's probably better, a better way of evaluating your risk, and, and that's something called a GENO score. 
there is a, a new uh, saliva-based test that is available in the doctor's office. Uh, the technology was actually uh, developed over in the UK, uh, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, and what it is, it relies upon a saliva sample. Uh, and with that simple saliva test, it's sent off to the laboratory. And about four weeks later, you will receive what's called your Geno score which is on a continuum of zero to one. One maximal risk, zero minimal risk. But what's unique about this Geno score is it's not just looking at two genes, ApoE3 and ApoE4. It's actually looking at over 100,000 genes. Lordy, I didn't know we had that many. <laughs> that, that, that can contribute to the development of uh, age-related dementia. Age, late, late age dementia. So it's a very important tool that we use in our office. And what I'll typically do is when I see a patient for Alzheimer's disease, if they're accompanied by their child or even grandchild, I'll say, look, it, it looks like grandma, you know, has mild Alzheimer's. So we're going to start to treat that. But also because she's got this and there may be a family history, is that something you would be interested in? So that's the question that I pose to the caregiver, if it's a family member, uh, typically a son, a daughter, grandchild, whatever, uh, that if you're bringing in a, a senior relative to the doctor, and that senior relative has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, this Geno score test can now give you a great idea as to what your risks are. So if you say, oh my gosh, what happens if I come out at higher risk? Well, at that point, that's when you got to start the mind diet, the daily walking, all of those things. And then we neurologists would keep an eye on you as time goes on. And if you start to manifest any of these signs or symptoms of an early dementia, we'll go in and treat. Because the earlier we can catch, catch uh, this condition, the better off the prognosis. So that's where we are. The Geno score is an amazing tool. And we use it now very frequently in our office to help those family members who are concerned about their uh, relative risk of developing Alzheimer's later on in life. And that's currently not re readily available everywhere. So would it be beneficial if I put your contact in the show notes if oh, people absolutely. were interested? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, we've, we've got a, uh, my, my website, or I should say our group website is fcneurology.net, as in firstchoiceneurology.net, but it's fcneurology.net. But we've got a great program, a chat program called neurotogo.com. So if you I like it, if you would, if you would put that in your uh, podcast, I, I'd be very grateful. Neuro to go, any URO number two, go.com. And with that, anybody from anywhere in the world uh, can spend uh, time with me or one of my board certified colleagues. Uh, we can really discuss any aspect of dementia or any other neurological condition that is of concern. And if that individual wants to uh, have access to that um, Geno score test, we can send it out to them because that test is only available through a doctor. Unfortunately, you can't go to Walgreens or CVS or Walmart and, and buy the test. And it takes about four weeks to come back. The test results go to a laboratory and that laboratory does its sophisticated testing to identify and put together these 100,000 different gene products that contribute to the overall Alzheimer risk. And, and then we circle back with that uh, individual and we discuss what that, what that Geno score number means and what we can do to intervene and mitigate the risk of dementia later on in life. That sounds wonderful. And I know a lot of people are like, I don't want to know, but you've laid out reasons well, why no, no. we you, should. You do, you, you do want to know, Jennifer, because there's a lot of things that you can do right now, right now. And, and the data that I'm sharing with all of our listeners today is that between the mind diet and this significant exercise of, of just 30 minutes a day, that does mitigate the risk. And this is not just hocus pocus or feel good medicine. This is, this is supported by numerous uh, numerous uh, reports in the medical literature. I've said a lot. I don't really think modern life or the way our modern life is structured these days is all that healthy for our brains. You know, we've got air pollution, stress, you know, not necessarily the best water. People are, they don't exercise. They don't get good sleep. 
all these things are very bad for us. Is is I, am I on am I on track like modern life? We got to learn how to well, disconnect and all that good stuff. Well, I, I look things have things have been tough all over for many years. I mean, if you slept if your bed was next to the Pompeii volcano <laughs> years ago, well, you didn't have a very good quality of life then because the second that volcano erupted, poof, that was the end. So, you know, yeah, modern modern life is stressful, but I think life has always been stressful. Uh, what's happening now is that people aren't exercising and moving the way they used to. And I guarantee you, all right, you gave me a little hint. You were born in what year? You 1966. Said, okay. All right, so 66. So you're, you're, you're the uh, tail end of the baby boomers. But I guarantee you, your mom walked a lot. And your grandmother was out there on a Saturday beating the rugs on the on the line. And she probably walked to a lot of places. People, I mean, when we were little, you know, I'm the I'm, uh, same age as you. When we were little, my parents didn't chauffeur me. <laughs> we didn't have carpools. I had, a, I had a, I'm not saying I was Abraham Lincoln and had to walk two miles to school. Well, I did walk two miles to school. Yes, I would a walk, maybe 15 miles. But, you know, we were on our bikes. I mean, I on, on a Saturday, which was my mother's cleaning day, my brother and I were kick, kicked out of the house at eight o'clock in the morning. And, you know, age eight. And we weren't <laughs> allowed back in until dinner time when the bell was rung for dinner. We were on our bikes. We were running around. You know, we were hooligans. That's what we used to. That's what we were called back in the day. Hooligans. Uh, so kids in those days were much more active than I think they are today. We we didn't have, you know, unlimited screen time. We didn't have uh video game. We didn't have any of that. We had we had cowboys and Indians, you know, which is not <laughs> even politically correct anymore. That's so true. All, all the things that we did, you probably can't even do anymore because it's not politically correct. Uh but with that being said, you know, I grew up in a in a time, as did you, when you were active. We were just active bowling parties on Saturday. All of these things, we were active. And the activities now, these uh, these kids really are not as active as I think prior generations were. And, and that predisposes to uh, worse physical conditioning. And we know that worse physical conditioning is a risk factor for dementia. So what I always tell everybody is the more you you the more you can move, the better off you are. The better off you are. Well, every time my Apple Watch tells me it's time to stand up, I do little stretches and I, I don't just stand up and wander around. I actually Yeah, I, I agree. I have the same thing. I call them exercise snacks. Mm -hmm. Just like you would reach in the refrigerator and take a an app, a, a, a candy snack. Well, I take an exercise snack, or I recommend an exercise snack. So, for the amount of time and attention that you would spend on going to the refrigerator or going into the cupboard and opening up a bag of Doritos, that's the amount of time that you could spend uh, doing something vigorous, mobile, an exercise snack. I call it an exercise meal which is your daily routine on your Peloton or uh, walking or biking. And then your exercise snack is what you do uh, in the morning around 11 o'clock, get up from your desk, walk around very quickly, uh, or climb a flight of stairs or do some, up, uh, uh, unload the dishwasher, you know, all of those things. And then you do that again in the afternoon. And one of the things that we need to be mindful of is in the post-COVID era, a lot of people are working from home, which means your activities might be going from the bedroom to the kitchen table to log on to the computer screen. Whereas prior to COVID, we had to get ourselves ready to go to work, take the bus, whatever we used to have to do. Well, a lot of that activity has been truncated. Uh, so, you know, post COVID, in many respects, has facilitated physical deconditioning. In a lot of us now, obviously, you know, Peloton was really on a on a on a high high road during COVID, and God bless. But people have to, in the post COVID time, if they're working from home, really be as as vigorous and as aggressive as they can with regard to maintaining their their physical fitness and stamina. 
You take the time that you were commuting and you walk the dog or the kids. You walk the kids to school would be a good option. Or you jump on the Peloton in the garage like I do. And then I have to come down the stairs to my office, which means I got to go back up the stairs for lunch. So, Good. you know. All of those things are important. Those are little exercise snacks. Yep. Well, this has been fantastic. Is there any last tidbit you want to leave the listeners with before I let you go? And last it's the tidbit, end of the day for you. <laughs> uh, last tidbit that I would leave our listeners with is if you think you have a problem, there's nothing stronger than human intuition. Act upon it. And act on it, meaning seek medical attention. And if you're not getting the answers you seek, you, you want, then seek more medical attention because somebody is out there who knows the answers to your question. And again, if that individual is not available to people in certain uh, places, well, now in the day of telehealth and televisit, we doctors are accessible from all corners of the earth. So, you know, my our, our platform here, neurotogo.com, does a great job of touching everyone all over the country and all over the world. But it's not that hard to interface with a doctor on a telehealth or tele, telechat basis. And the testing that I've discussed, the evaluation that I've discussed can be done remotely. We've got lots of patients that we've worked up, diagnosed, and managed from far away. Uh, I've got patients as far away as Seoul, South Korea. So it's it's not hard to get the attention. You just have to do a little homework. You just gotta be okay. persistent. And and I and I and I applaud uh, your podcast, Fading Memories, because you know, you're getting the message out there. So as long as things are front and center, then people don't feel like they're alone uh, and they know that there are resources for them. Yep. That was why I started this, because it was hard to find what I was looking for. And like I said earlier, it's dramatically changed in six years. So yeah. it'll be very interesting to see what it's like in another six. Exactly. Well, invite me back in six years and I'll say, <laughs> oh, here's my magic wand. This is how we cure things. <laughs> oh, but that would be nice. Unfortunately, I don't have that tool yet, but hopefully one day. But for the time being, you know, we, we've got great, great uh, access to wonderful uh, diagnostic modalities that can get people uh, the answers they seek. Well, that sounds like a great place to end. I really appreciate your time. I'm sure the listeners do as well. And I will make sure that neuro to go is linked in the show notes. So you guys can contact um, Dr. Jeff if you need to. And, you know, this has been great because I have, I've had many conversations with people who are like, I'm not doing the testing. I don't want to know. And I basically try to ease them into why, yes, it would not be fun to know, but here's, Here's why it's not fun to get it run over with it by a car like we were. I mean, we knew my mom had problems, but there's a lot of ignoring. So well, don't not, and, don't do that. And as and as as we've discussed now over the past uh, hour together, these tests and results are actionable. There's something that we can do, and that's that. That means all all the impact in the world because if we can do something with the information to help our patients than we must and we should. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. And hopefully we can come back in another year or so and like you said, have a whole different conversation because things have changed so much. Would love to. And thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Have a, have a great afternoon. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.